So with this, I would like to, uh, to uh, invite our guest lecturer. This year it's Professor Peretz Lavi. He's been a friend of mine for 20 some years now and so forth. And he is the dreamer, the one that established, the, he made major contributions in sleep disorder, in understanding research of sleep. Among other things, he also established the sleep disorder uh, labs or, uh, here in Israel, practically everywhere, and uh, also in Boston and several other places around the world. It's his initiative. Some of the two initiatives that some of you have heard is one of them that when I was a soldier in the army, that we used to train as being sleep deprived because when it's war, you need to function under sleep deprivation. But Peretz uh, proved that it's not trainable. And since then, there is this rule that you before, uh, that you need to have a given number of hours of sleep. That's one thing. The other thing is Shaat Efes, zero hour. When I was a student in high school, uh, uh, twice a week or so, we used to come at seven o'clock in the morning, Shat Efes, yes? Never mind, I was punished, so I had to come Shat Efes every year, for every day for a year. <laughs> but uh, they, it was canceled. When my kids went to high school, there was no Shat Efes anymore. And this is parents responsible for that. Because he proved that actually it doesn't contribute and we are losing a precious hour in the morning, a precious hour of sleep. So with this, I'll call on Peretz. It's a pleasure to be here, I must say. Uh, Julian investing in, uh, investing in Israel, this is the best investment. And the return on investment is uh, immense. So it gives me a, a great pleasure to be your entertainment tonight. And um, I kind of ask myself, should I talk about my research? And I've decided that I'm going to uh, focus on my heroes in brain research and sleep research. And there is some lesson from these heroes that I'm sure that uh, you'll discover during my presentation. Um, this is Hypnos. Hypnos was the goddess of sleep in Greek mythology. And uh, in fact, he was the uh, twin brother of Thanatos, the god of death. And here you see a wall painting of Hypnos, the white twin, and Thanatos, the black one, carry a warrior that was killed in battle to his grave. They were twins. And there is a reason for that, because sleep was considered to be a death for a short period of time. In fact, nothing happened during sleep. This uh, belief, in fact, uh, can be found in every religion. Uh, religious Jews in the morning, thank God for, uh, thanks God for giving uh, back the soul that was deposited at the hands of God during sleep. The same uh, uh, prayer uh, uh, you can find in uh, Islam and uh, in Christianity. So sleep was considered to be a death for a, a limited period of time. But there was one thing which was an outlier. And these are dreams. This is a picture that was taken from an issue of the National Geographic about 25 years ago that was dedicated to sleep. It was taken in Delphi, in Greece, which was a place that dreams were incubated. People used to come to Delphi to sleep in the area of the amphitheater, and in the morning, they used to tell the Pitya, the high priest, the dream, and the interpretation of the dream was a kind of a guideline for the person how to continue with his life. Dreams were not part of sleep. Dreams were messages coming from above, from gods. So there was sleep, which was death, and dreams that were messages that came from above. And, uh, it's hard to believe the role of dreams, not only in the life of the individual, but in the life of nation. I'm sure you recognize this dream. Now, just imagine what could happen if Joseph would make a mistake in the interpretation of this dream. The seven fat cows, the seven thin cows, 
and Pharaoh would make him second, and uh, he won't bring his brothers. There was no exodus. What will be the faith of the Jewish people? This started with this dream. I remember I gave a, a similar talk uh, in a different occasion, and I said that we, the Jewish people, pay the price of Muhammad's dream. Muhammad never visited Jerusalem. Never. He dreamt about it. We pay the price. We pay the price. He dreamt that on his horse he landed uh, in uh, Jerusalem, and from that point on, Jerusalem became part of the Islam. So dreams paid, uh, uh, played a major role in the life of individuals and nations. And of course, uh, artists try to uh, uh, um, kind of uh, uh, take the essence of dream. I'm sure you know this dream. This is Jacob's dream when he uh, uh, dreamt on his way back to meet his brother uh, uh, when he fought the angel. So this is Joe de Ribera, and uh, this is uh, uh, Giovanni Battista, and you can see the angels going up and down, and then this uh, Domenico Fetti. This is a very popular subject in the art of uh, Jacob Dream. And this is my first hero. We took the dreams from God and uh, repositioned them. Dreams come from within. The interpretation of dreams by Sigmund Freud that was published in 1900 is probably one of the most important books in Western civilization. In fact, nobody believed him. But what Freud said was, dreams are a product of part of our personality that is inaccessible during the waking time. And there is a way how to understand dreams by using a very unique technique. And uh, dreams, suddenly, are not God messages. They are messages that come from behind. And you have to understand this message in order to use it in your own life. Um, as I said, the interpretation of dreams, 1900, this is first hero who stood against the trend. He was very isolated. Nobody really believed in him. But he persistent, he was persistent. He was very, uh, uh, um, I would say, talented. And uh, he changed the course of uh, thinking, both about sleep and about dreams. And this is my second hero, Konstantin von Economo. Konstantin von Economo is a very interesting person. He was born in Romania, educated in France, and found himself in Vienna as a neuropsychiatrist. It so happened that around the 1915-1920, there was an epidemic of encephalitis that killed about 20 million people around the world. Today we know about SARS and we know about Ebola, but this was a major epidemic, and people died in many, many parts of the world. There were 20 million people who died. But it's very interesting that the people who died displayed two types of behavior. One slept without uh, waking up for weeks, and then they, they died. The other part suffered from insomnia, lack of sleep for weeks, and they, they died. Because of the relationship to sleep, the uh, epidemic was called encephalitis lethargica, brain inflammation related to lethargic uh, uh, changes in uh, sleep and the state of economy. Later, it was called the von Economo disease. Von Economo, because of curiosity, decided to analyze the brains of patients who died because of encephalitis lethargica and to compare those that died because of insomnia or related to insomnia and those that died because of hypersomnia, excessive sleepiness. And what he found was that in these two types of encephalitis lethargica, the brain lesion was located in different parts of the brain. Interestingly, 
Uh, if you look to patients who, lie, who died after prolonged sleepiness, the lesion was here, what we call the, now, the reticular formation, the part of the brain that is controlled waking. When patients died because of, or after prolonged insomnia, the lesion was around the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Now, this uh, was a revelation. Sleep is related to distinct brain centers. There is one brain center that control waking. And if this brain center is lesioned, the patient suffers from prolonged sleepiness. And there is one brain center that is related to sleep. And if this is lesioned, the patient suffers from prolonged insomnia. This is a totally new idea. Now, uh, today, we just confirm what von Econo found in the early 20th century. If we stimulate the area of the brainstem during a sleep, this is a sleep EEG of a sleeping animal. If we stimulate the brainstem during sleep, we immediately uh, change the state from wake sleep to wakefulness. If we stimulate the thalamus during wakefulness, we immediately induce sleep. And the reverse happen when we lesion this center. This is the brain of an animal. If you lesion the thalamus, sleep is again uh, deprived. The animal continuously show wakefulness like the patients of von Economo with encephalitis lethargica. And the reverse, when we lesion uh, the reticular formation, wakefulness disappear and the animal continuously sleep like von Economo uh, study. Interestingly enough, researchers today believe that they discover it. And the, this is a, a, from the Harvard Medical School, Microsoft Excel Encyclopedia by Clay Faust. It's now known that sleep and wakefulness are both active states controlled by specific groups of brain structures. And he cite here a very well-known sleep researchers from Harvard who, in his paper, believed that he discovered the sleep centers. Read history. You must read history. Because uh, in many cases, findings reported, by the way, von Economo paper uh, was published in uh, German. Very few people uh, read it. And uh, he pinpointed the brain centers related to sleep and the balance between them that decide whether a patient will suffer from insomnia or hypersomnia. Interestingly, I found that uh, the Austrian Republic issued a book, a, a stamp carried the uh, face of von Economo, and I thought that this is because of his discoveries in neuropathology. Then I realized that I was mistaken. He was the first pilot in the Austrian army participated in First World War as a pilot. Uh, then they grounded him because his, father, his brother was killed. So the stamp uh, was related to his army service and not to his scientific discovery. My second uh, 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 link with von Economo is related to uh, Oliver Sacks. How many of you read uh, Oliver Sacks books? Very nice, very nice. One of his uh, fascinating books is uh, Awakenings. In Awakenings, he described the discovery of L-DOPA and how L-DOPA was used on patients with encephalitis lethargica. He was, uh, by the way, he was British. He was a nephew of Jonathan Sachs, the Lord Rabbi of the UK. And uh, he died, uh, I think, last year. And he discovered in aged homes in London, in New York, mostly Jewish patients, that remained asleep since the attack of encephalitis lethargica. Since in the 50s, L-DOPA was considered to be a magic drug, he decided, let's see what L-DOPA is going to do to the patients. The amazing uh, discovery was that the patients woke up 
Suddenly, after 10 years, they woke up. This was a, so fascinating that it led to a movie, Awakenings. Robin Williams was Oliver Sacks, and the patient was Robert De Niro. The problem was the side effects. The side effects were so severe of uh, abnormal motor behavior and uh, violent behavior that they have to stop the experiment. Um, interestingly enough, and very disappointing, Oliver Sacks in his book doesn't mention the name, the name Konstantin von Economo. I found uh, a stamp carrying the first EEG record, electroencephalographic record, Italian stamp, and uh, it display St. Val Valentine. I'm sure you are familiar with Valentine Day, but you probably don't know that Valentine was also the saint of the epileptic patients. So maybe there is a relationship between love and epileptic attack. Think about it. Who discovered the EEG, the electroencephalographic activity or the brain activity related to uh, now to almost every kind of research that is done on the brain? I would say that the start was with two German researchers, uh, Fritz and Heitzig, the show that if you stimulate certain brain areas, you can cause motor activity, contractions of muscles. They published it in 1870, and this opened the road for research between brain activity, electrical brain activity, and uh, uh, a variety of motor and uh, sensory functions. I'm not going to talk about all the researchers. I'm going to focus on three of them. Um, a British one, a Polish one, and a German one. And all three of them discovered spontaneous electroencephalographic activity without realizing what they discovered. Richard Caton from Liverpool, Beck from Poland, and Hans Berger from Jena in Germany. Now, Richard Caton decided to see what happened if you make a movement, can you see a collateral electrical activity? But when he put the electrodes on the exposed brain, he found continuous spontaneous electrical activity on the surface of the dog brain he was studying with his reflecting galvanometer. Unfortunately, Caton took little interest in this spontaneous activity. Now, when you read the paper, and it was published in 1875 in the Chicago Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, he wrote, the following is a brief summary of the principal results. In every brain hitherto examined, the galvanometer has indicated the existence of electrical currents. The external surface of the gray matter is usually positive in relation to the surface of the section through it, feeble currents of varying direction pass through the multiplier when the electrodes are placed on two points of the external surface. He discovered that the brain produced spontaneous electrical activities. He didn't understand what he found. Interestingly enough, he was a very curious paper. Narcolepsy is a very nasty disease. Patients fall asleep during the day, losing the control of their muscles. It's an attack of dreaming sleep during the waking state. The first case of narcolepsy that was published is by Richard Caton from Liverpool. Unfortunately, he made a mistake. This is not narcolepsy. What he described is sleep apnea syndrome. These are the patients who stop breathing during sleep hundreds of times and fall asleep during the day as a consequence of the multiple awakenings during sleep. And uh, when you read the description of this paper, a 37-old Paul Terrer, who was admitted in my ward in the Liverpool Royal Infirmary on January 12, 1888, complaining of intense drowsiness and of chronic psoriasis. He used to fall asleep holding a chicken in his hand and the customer already came. When you read it, it's constantly while serving the customers in his shop, sleep would come on as he stood by the counter 
he would awaken and find himself holding in his hand the duck or chicken which he had been selling to the customer a quarter of an hour before. Standing and sleeping. When you read it, this is a sleep apnea patient. When in sound asleep, a very peculiar state of the glottis is observed, a spasmodic closure entirely suspending respiration. The thorax and the abdomen are seen to heave from fruitless contractions of the inspiratory and expiratory muscles. I was a keynote speaker in the 100th anniversary, the centennial anniversary of the American Respiratory Society. It was in San Diego. And there was an exhibition outside. And there was a huge poster. Who discovered sleep apnea? The Dean of Medicine of Harvard Medical School in 1956. I gave the talk and I showed this slide and they want to bury themselves. And again, people don't read history. This was described in minute details. And by the way, the treatment that this patient uh, uh, responded to was weight reduction. And we know today that uh, obese patients with sleep apnea respond to weight reduction. So again, Adam's scholars don't ignore history. It's important. There are the night nurse states that these attacks go on all through the night. Patient himself is unaware of them, except him from what others tell him. His wife states that they have been occurred with varying frequency for some years. This is a, cl a, a classical sleep apnea patients. I have not yet found anything in medical literature which throws much light on this case. And as the patient is likely to come into my hands again, I should be very grateful if any member of this society can give me hints in reference to diagnosis and treatment. Interestingly enough, at the discussion that followed the presentation of the case, Christopher Heath, the president of the London Clinical Society, alluded to the resemblance between Caton's patient and Joe, the sleepy character from Dickens' book, Posthumous Papers of the PQ and Clyde. And from that point on, these patients are known as the Pequican patients not in, discovered by uh, uh, the Dean of Medicine in Harvard in 1956. This is a picture of the Pequican patient from this paper. So, Richard Caton studied uh, spontaneous brain activities using galvanometer. No recognition was given to him. He is better rem remembered as the Lord Mayor of Liverpool in 1907 and his work received no attention among English-speaking electrophysiologists. Interesting, the Lancet, in its obituary column, did not even mention Caton's contributions to electrophysiology. And the B British Medical Journal noted only that he did some work on the localization of movements, etc. Adolf Beck. Adolf Beck was Jewish, and uh, he uh, uh, moved from... Uh, uh, he was born in Krakow, and uh, he was uh, uh, in the Department of Physiology of Jaglonian University in 1889. Then he moved to uh, Lvov. He became the Dean of Medicine, and he studied how sensory stimulation affect brain activity. And again, using the same technology, putting electrodes on exposed brain, shining light in the eye of the animal, he found the same findings as Caton found with motor activity. Without any stimulation, the brain emit electro, electrical waves. And uh, he reported it. Again, nobody paid attention. This was the tragic end when the Nazis took over. His son, who was a physician, helped him to commit suicide. And this is the end of the Beck family in Poland. Hans Berger. Hans Berger was a psychiatrist. And uh, as you can see here, he also committed suicide in 1941. He believed in parapsychology. He believed that you can move objects with the power of your mind. How to prove it? He decided to put electrodes on the hand. And when you concentrate in order to move the object, you probably can find changes in electrical activity in the brain that can 
be correlated with the amount of energy you invest in the movement. Lo and behold, what he found was that uh, the brain emit electrical waves spontaneously. He published his first paper in 1929. Nobody believed him. Nobody believed him. He published 23 papers on the same subject. He showed that when you concentrate, you can block these waves, that these waves are changed when there is a, a a brain lesion or brain tumor, nobody believed him. In fact, people mocked him. They spoke about Berger waves, as if only the wave of, or only the brain of Franz Berger produced these waves. <laughs> now, he was lucky. Why he was lucky? Because Lord Edgar Douglas Adrian, a Nobel laureate, 1932, together with Charles Sherrington, decided to test if his own brain also generated the Berger waves. And he did it in an annual meeting of the British Physiological Society. In 1934, he stood on a stage in a meeting with 400 physiologists, put electrodes on his head, and he showed that once he shut his eyes, the waves appear. When he opened his eyes, the waves disappear. When he shut his eyes, again the, brain, the alpha brains appear. So, Lord Edgar Adrian Brain also emitted Hans Berger waves. And this was the turning point in understanding of electroencephalography. Interestingly enough, in his, uh, he found his uh, diary, and he, uh, in his diary he said that they turn an ECG machine, one channel, into a device that allowed them to measure the brain waves. And the moment they connected it. Immediately they discovered the brain, the brain waves. Now, this was the turning point. Who used EEG to study sleep? And here there is another, I would say, surprise, at least to me. Everybody in the sleep area know the paper by Loomis et al, who showed that brain activity change when we move from wake to sleep. The brains are completely different with respect to amplitude, with respect to frequency. But who was Loomis? Well, Loomis was uh, an American attorney, investment banker, philanthropist, scientist physicist, an inventor of uh, a long-range navigation system, and a lifelong pattern of scientific research. And he opened his own private laboratory in what is called Tuxedo Park, and his technology allowing to record sleep for many, many hours. This was, uh, this is unexpected. And uh, his paper paved the way for the scientific discovery of sleep. Uh, this is the sleep chamber. It's a Faraday cage, which allowed to record it without uh, uh, any interruptions. And this is the uh, uh, a device that allowed him to record sleep for eight hours. And he showed that the change from wake to sleep is accompanied by changes in the frequency and amplitude of the EEG. This was the first paper that started the scientific study of sleep. And I come now to uh, my third uh, or fourth hero, Nathaniel Kleitman. I met Nathaniel Kleitman many times along my career. I interviewed him the last time when he was 100. He died when he was 104. You won't believe, a Jewish refugee from the Kishinev pogrom, 1903, 1904, this was the Kishinev pogrom. He escaped. He decided to go to Pal Palestine, Ottoman Palestine. First World War caught him in Beirut port, the only ship was an American ship in the port, and he found himself in Alice Island in New York. He went to Georgia to get a first degree. He found out that Georgia at that time wasn't so friendly to Jews. Went to University of Chicago, and he was the first professional sleep researcher. By the way, this is taken from the same issue of the National Geographic that I mentioned before. This was the cover of the issue, Kleitman looking at the stars. 
His first book, published by University of Chicago in 1939, had 1,434 references related to sleep in all languages. He had two, sis two daughters who, uh, uh, I remember he showed me the cards in which they wrote handwriting, the references that uh, uh, he used in his book. Uh, he wrote in 1939 about uh, uh, the functional differences between wakefulness and sleep, the course of events during sleep phase, periodicity, etc., etc. He was the first sleep researcher. He did himself studies, he invented some technology. Here he used some kind of uh, what we call now, everybody has the Fitbit. He used a very primitive Fitbit connected to the band to follow body movements of the sleeper and to correlate it with body temperature. And then, in order to find out, he looked how caffeine affects sleep and our alcohol. And you can see that uh, movements or the temperature is clearly affected by caffeine and the amount of movements during sleep is uh, uh, clearly affected by caffeine. I'm talking about studies done in the 30s and 40s of the 20th century. Then he studied how 40 hours of sleep deprivation affect the temperature cycle. And he found that it remains, even though we uh, deprive the subject of sleep. No, this is... He went to the Mammoth Cave in Kentucky and spent there more than a month in order to regulate the wake sleep cycle by light and darkness. Uh, the story is that uh, he has to put the beds into uh, bottles of water because of the rats that uh, uh, used to climb on the bed. Uh, here he comes out of this cave with the governor of Kentucky. He induced a 21-hour day, 24-hour day, 28-hour day, and show that temperature cycle is synchronized with the day uh, uh, with the light dark cycle. This is the cover of his book in which he followed a baby from the first day of birth, uh, fed on demand, sleep wake cycle, and he show these tendencies of prolonging the sleep wake cycle and consolidation of the wake and the sleep. But his major discovery was made in 1953. In 1953, he reported in a science paper together with his student Azrinsky on REM sleep, regularly occurring periods of eye motility and comitant phenomena during sleep. Here, he reported that during sleep, there are periods when we have rapid eye movements, brain waves resemble wakefulness. When you wake up the sleeper, he reports in a vivid and detailed dream. This was the turning point in uh, sleep research. And you can see here a cycle of sleep. These are the stages of sleep discovered by Loomis. Stage four is the delta sleep, the delta waves, and the black bars are the dreaming sleep. And the cycle persisted, persists during the night. Uh, interestingly, uh, I followed the, how this paper was cited. Again, Adam's scholars, don't be disturbed if you have a major breakthrough and your paper is not cited. The paper that changed sleep for eight years was not cited at all. Was not cited at all. And this is very typical of papers that are outliers with respect to the major discovery. And I can give you some more examples if you want. But it's amazing that uh, a major discovery about our life and about dreaming didn't catch any attention for almost eight years. Then, again, it was uh, uh, cited, and uh, the total until 2005, when I did this slide, was uh, 1183. He published uh, a second edition of his book in uh, 1963. At that time, he had 4,337 references, just to show you what happened between 39 and uh, 63. Uh, this is Kleitman as a young man, and this is when he celebrated 100 
and uh, I interviewed him, and uh, he told me, you know why I decided to go to Ottoman Palestine? I wanted to walk at Mikve Israel. <laughs> well, he became the first sleep researcher. Michel Jouvet died a few months ago. He was probably the best uh, uh, neurophysiologist to study sleep. He discovered the control mechanism of REM sleep at the local Cyrillus, at uh, the brainstem. And uh, very interestingly, in uh, 1981, I saw a patient that was referred to me from rehabilitation center because of shouts during sleep. I studied him, and uh, lo and behold, what we found out, he had almost no REM sleep. You can see very few REM sleep here. Uh, usually each one of us has about 20% of our sleep in REM sleep, between 18 and 25%. This patient has almost no REM sleep, and uh, he was normal. He suffered from some neurological damages because he was injured on the Suez Canal during the attrition war with a sharp nail that uh, uh, penetrated his brain. When he was injured, there was no CT, so we decided to do CT on him, and what we found out is that the sharp nail hit the brainstem at the precise location that Michel Jouvet found the executive mechanism of REM sleep. Precisely the same mechanism. Now, uh, this is the site here that the locus curulius is located. Uh, interestingly enough, another phenomenon during REM sleep is penile erection in males and engorgement of uh, uh, sexual uh, 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 vagina, uh, blood flow to the vagina in women. Uh, this was discovered, by the way, before REM sleep was discovered. This was done by uh, uh, penal circumferences of temperature, and you can see the resemblance, the correlation between REM periods measured by EEG and eye movements and penal direction. Uh, interestingly enough, our patient uh, had cycles of penile direction at the precise time that REM was expected. So maybe we don't need REM, but we need in sleep only penile directions. Michel Jouvet learned about it, and he sent me a picture, a very interesting picture, from one of the caves of uh, uh, the um, primitive paintings. And you can see that during sleep, they also uh, detected penile directions. Our case, by the way, I can use his name. He became a very good friend. He allowed us to use his name, Yuval Hamzani. He is uh, Mr. Logical Puzzles in Israel. And uh, um, he... Uh, became uh, the only patient known to medicine uh, recorded by the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, longest and shorter dreams, dreaming sleep, blah, blah. Uh, he is the only known person alive without almost any REM sleep who is completely normal. Interestingly enough, uh, with Yuval Nir from Tel Aviv University, uh, I convinced Yuval to ask Yuval, uh, to Yuval Hamzani if he's ready to sleep again in the laboratory. We did it a few weeks, a few months ago, and uh, we found out that he still have, here he didn't have anything, here he had splinters, here he has some, still no REM sleep. He's normal, he's uh, active, he's a lawyer, he's a painter, he's creative. I wish I had his memory. So what is the function of our REM sleep? This is an enigma, no doubt about it. These are the leaders, Azerinsky, Few months, few years after this picture was taken, he was killed in a car accident. Kleitman at 100, Michel Jouvet, and Bill Deman from Stanford who was also one of the, the one who showed the correlation between dreaming and REM sleep. Now, few facts about uh, dreaming sleep just to conclude my presentation. We need dreaming sleep. Why Yuval Hamzani finding was so dramatic? If I take any one of you, any one of you, and I try to wake him up every time he enters REM sleep. Next night, I'll, instead of 31 awakenings, I'll need 51 awakenings, and then 64 awakenings, and I'll have to stop the experiment because the pressure to REM sleep is mounting. We need REM sleep. So you cannot uh, function during the day without REM sleep. Another point, which uh, to me is one of the most, I would say, neglected aspects of REM sleep is the fact that during REM sleep, the corpus callosum is silent. The two hemispheres of the brain are not talking with each other. 
This was shown for the first time by an uh, Italian investigator, and uh, Berlucchi, and uh, this was a 65, uh, 1965 paper, ignored completely, ignored completely. But he showed in a cat, when the cat enter REM sleep, these are the eye movements, this is the muscle atonia. I forgot to mention that during REM sleep we are paralyzed. The um, uh, muscles, the motor muscles are paralyzed, and this is a functional paralysis. The activity in the corpus callosum is silent. So the brain hemisphere, the left hemisphere, is not talking with the right hemisphere. And think about it, the two hemispheres are doing completely different things. If they don't talk with each other, we have uh, a, a brain split patient during sleep. Now, uh, this is the corpus callosum. And uh, think about it, that the dolphin, the dolphin is sleeping only with one hemisphere. He must keep one hemisphere awake. Why? Because he has only one respiratory system, and this is the voluntary respiratory system. In order to keep it active, he must have active hemisphere. So we have now a sleeping brain when one of the brain is asleep and one of the brain is awake. And uh, when we look into blood, blood flow during sleep, uh, from the change from wake to sleep and the change from non-REM, which are all the other stages to REM sleep, are uh, uh, in fact uh, characterized by completely different pattern of, of blood flow. And uh, we showed it that uh, the brain during REM sleep get the maximum amount of brain and the sexual area get the maximum amount of, brain, of blood. Uh, we showed that the blood is squeezed out from the periphery during REM sleep and uh, we showed it by measuring blood flow from the fingers and the blood flow from the periphery is uh, uh, directed to the brain on the one hand and to uh, the sexual organs on the other hand. And uh, this is uh, the amount of uh, blood uh, in the fingers that reach the minimum amount during REM sleep. These are the e EOG, the electroencephalic activity. So this is the story of my uh, heroes in sleep. Don't be afraid if you have some results that are completely out line. Don't be afraid if nobody accepted it. If you believe in what you have found, stick to it. Insist on what you have. I wish you all great success, and I would like to repeat what Moti said. We would like you here. <laughs>